Welcome back to Children and Crisis, our workshop that's dealing with the effects of the current upheavals and past upheavals. And our topic today is childhood displacement. More young people have been displaced in recent years than at any other time in human history. They're displaced by environmental forces, they're displaced by economic forces, they're displaced by war and civic conflict. Migration, even if it results in a better life, is deeply disruptive. So what does it mean for children to experience upheaval? How does it reshape the process of growing up? What are its lifelong consequences? The best answers can only be found by looking backward. That's the only record that we have. Only if we look to the past can we begin to understand how we can move forward judiciously. Our first speaker, Anita, I turn the floor to you. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about trauma and unaccompanied child migrants in U.S. history. Um, and th this conversation will be slightly more theoretical with some sprinkled in bits from the history of child migration. Um, so jumping right in, I have a new book out on unaccompanied child migration to the U.S. And in this book, In Suffer the Little Children, I look at the history of unaccompanied child migration to the United States dating back to the 1930s until the present day. Um, I began in the 1930s, although it should be said that unaccompanied child migrants have been coming to the U.S. since the colonial era. The first ones were unaccompanied African children who were separated from parents, enslaved, and brought to the U.S. Um, <clears throat> I start in the, in the U.S. in the 1930s, however, because that is when the first programs in which the federal government explicitly recognized unaccompanied children as a group began. Um, in this book, I argue that um, the different groups of children that we have admitted or excluded since the 1930s um, were admitted or excluded primarily due to geopolitical and domestic political considerations rather than humanitarianism, although the discourse has been framed in humanitarian terms. Um, when I, when I started preparing for this, this conference, I decided I'm gonna write a paper on trauma and unaccompanied child migration. Um, and I thought, let's go back and see what I said about trauma in the book. And I encountered a quote that by the time I'd been reading about trauma for two or three weeks, I realized, no, like that's wrong. <laughs> I, like many other people, had been using the word trauma in sort of a casual colloquial way that doesn't actually line up with its meaning in sort of clinical terms, right? Um, in, in my book, in the introduction to my book, I say that despite the tremendous diversity of experiences of unaccompanied child migrants, whether they were European Jewish children before and during World War II, um, displaced children after the war, Hungarian youths that left Hungary after the 1956 uprising, Southeast Asian children, Central American children. Despite this diversity, I claimed quite blithely in the introduction to my book that the one thing that binds them together is the suffering and trauma of successive generations of unaccompanied minors, as well as the remarkable courage, creativity, and resilience they have demonstrated in rebuilding their lives in the United States. Now, I still stand by everything in this statement except the way that I've used the word trauma. Um, but we live and we learn and we keep writing, don't we? Right? So then the question I had to ask myself is precisely what is trauma, right? You're a social worker, aren't you, Ruben? So he's nodding. He's like, yes, thank you. <laughs> right? So I started Googling and reading, um, and the American Psychological Association definition that's online, I thought, let's just take this as sort of a standard definition that most people would accept today. Um, the idea that trauma is an emotional or psychological response after a terrible disruptive event um, that follows often a period of shock and denial 
and that manifests in symptoms, a range of symptoms, which can include um, unpredictable or unregulated emotions, flashbacks, intrusive thoughts, um, d diminishment of affect or attachment, strained relationships, physical symptoms, um, and importantly, that these feelings are normal, they happen to normal people, and that psychologists can help in reducing the symptoms or finding ways of managing this, right? Um, this is a very new understanding of trauma. Um, before the 1980s, this is not at all what people would have understood by trauma. I'm not gonna go into all of this, but there is a long history clinically and professionally of interpreting what we now understand as trauma. Um, beginning in the 1860s with a couple of physicians in Britain and in Germany who identified after effects in mass casualties of, of train accidents, the uh, symptoms that we would today understand probably as PTSD, that they attributed to otherwise indiscernible um, injuries to the spinal column. There then was a psychological turn around the, 20, uh, the turn of the, the 20th century in which trauma then became attributed to um, the combination of an external factor and an internal psychological weakness. And this would then be expressed in a uh, diagnosis of hysteria, which was coded originally as feminine. And then in sinistrosis, the idea of um, people who had workplace accidents and then refused to go back to work afterwards. Um, this condition, interestingly enough, was still diagnosed into the 60s and 70s, but only amongst immigrant workers. Um, World War I, of course, we know that shell shock became um, something that psychiatrists, particularly military psychiatrists, were looking at. But it was still very much a stigmatized thing, and it was linked to suspicions of malingering, people not wanting to go back to war, right? This thinking begins to change in World War II, um, in which they began to acknowledge that it was a symptom that wasn't tied to lying or malingering. Um, and then thinking about trauma evolved post-Holocaust with the identification of what they called concentration camp syndrome, survivor syndrome. But what we know today as trauma or as PTSD really emerges and enters the, um, the, the psychological and the psychiatric lexicon as a result of efforts by feminists in the 70s who were arguing for um, taking seriously the impact on women of sexual and intimate violence in the home, as well as anti-war activists who were searching for ways of sort of redeeming and reintegrating Vietnam War veterans who were seen as baby killers, right? Um, many did in fact participate in atrocities, right? But framing their trauma as having been people that both experienced combat but also participated in perpetuating violence, but framing them as similarly victims of trauma. Um, these two sort of unlikely forces came together with social workers, with psychiatrists, and as a result of this, we get the category of PTSD, right? Following that, we have journals, the Journal of Traumatic Stress. We have sort of an explosion of studies of trauma. Interestingly enough, it isn't until 1998 that we get the adverse child, um, what is it, adverse child experiences uh, study funded by Kaiser that for the first time took seriously the idea that childhood um, experiences could lead to trauma in adults, right? Obviously, the field is continuing to evolve. Lots of debates about the role of neuro neurology, um, epigenetics, structural violence, and its relationship to trauma, um, as well as resilience and post-traumatic growth, right? There's also a lot of critiques about trauma's assumptions of universality, right? That everybody experiences trauma and that it can be measured in the same ways, right? So this is kind of a, a history of what we know about trauma. Historiography. We don't have a historiography of trauma, right? We have, since the late 1990s, lots of historians who study groups of people and their trauma. But we have almost nothing on the evolution of trauma. There are a handful of social scientists, some literary theorists, um, that have done history um, to tell us this genealogy of trauma. And um, interesting, interestingly enough, Didier Fassan and Richard Reckman, um, the last book on this list, Empire of Trauma, themselves are both psychiatrists and cultural anthropologists, right? So this is probably, from what I've read so far, the best sort of history of thinking about trauma. But the children are nowhere 
in this very limited historiography. Now, why is that? To be fair, because it's really hard to figure out how to talk about children and trauma in history. Talking about trauma in history at all is difficult, right? First of all, trauma often appears long after an event, right? So how do we attribute it? How do we establish relationships of attribution or causality, right? That's one of the methodological problems that we face as historians. We also have to grapple with the fact that there are temporal and cultural differences in the language, in the very concepts that people use to discuss trauma. Um, it could be described as having a broken heart. It could be described as demonic possession. Uh, there are multiple different ways that people understand what we now understand trauma. The ways that people express trauma are also culturally conditioned, right? And the extent to which they seek help. For us as historians, this is equally important. Individuals, communities, and authorities often cover up trauma for a number of reasons, including oftentimes political reasons. We also selectively highlight particular forms of trauma and particular victims, right? So all of these things make it very difficult for us as historians to locate it in the past, right? Um, also, another important caveat, what we may understand as trauma, like I so blithely wrote in the introduction to my book, may not have been experienced as trauma by the actual people who lived it, right? Okay, now add to all of these difficulties all of the methodological challenges of the history of childhood, which I'm not going to repeat because you all know them, right? So how do we do this, right? I am proposing that we can develop an intersectional age-based analysis of trauma and that in doing so, we can help to develop the historiography of trauma. So how do we do this? I would suggest that we can read sources against the grain to look at adults' evolving understandings of trauma as related to children and childhood. And then we can also look at the way that those evolving understandings have impacted how adults have behaved towards children, the laws that they've made, the politics, the policy, the social and cultural structures and institutions. I also think it's extraordinarily important that we pay attention to how age intersects with children's race, with their class, with their sexuality, with their religion in history. We tend to not think of that as an important marker of difference today. It's very important when we look historically. Uh, national origin, to understand how trauma was interpreted and how the concept has been operationalized. So I propose to do this briefly today by looking at the unaccompanied migrant child, who is themselves an intersectional figure, right? Poised at the intersection between the category of child and the category of refugee, right? So with all of this sort of said, what I'd like to do is share a few very tentative arguments that I'd like to make about unaccompanied child migrants and trauma in US history. Um, I'm not going to back them up very well because I don't have time, but if you read my book, <laughs> it is all in there, right? Brilliant. So. Brilliant. <laughs> My first argument is that American child welfare workers, advocates, and the general public have long struggled and indeed often failed to see children's trauma as well as to effectively respond to it when working with unaccompanied child migration. This is partially due, of course, to evolving historical understandings of trauma in general. If we didn't have such a category, how could we see it, right? Um, it also has a lot to do with people's notions of children's unfinishedness, that they are works in progress, they are still becoming, right? Um, and so therefore, there's, there's been a historical tendency to not take seriously behaviors and symptoms that children are expected to grow out of, right? But I would also argue that Americans' political ideologies and their particularly raced and classed worldviews have also historically rendered them unable to see and to respond adequately to trauma in migrant children. Um, I tie this to some of the research in social work, which is probably something Ruben is very familiar with, right? The tendency of um, social workers who work with children in foster care, and most unaccompanied migrant children who are admitted to the US go through a version of the foster care system. Um, the tendency amongst American social workers and foster care workers has been to see racialized children's misbehavior or symptoms of trauma um, after being placed in care 
either as the result of their deficient previous home environments or of their own moral, cultural, or spiritual weakness or deviance, right? I argue that there is a similar tendency that we can see in the history of unaccompanied child migration amongst child welfare workers who placed unaccompanied child migrants to misattribute trauma or to not understand it as trauma as such, but rather as deficiencies in the child. Examples of this, right? And foster parents did it too, right? So there are numerous reports of foster parents um, during and dur previous to and during um, World War II of, of, of foster parents complaining to the German and then European Jewish Children's Aid Society, as well as to USCOM, the United States Committee for the Care of European Children, that the well-behaved and happy and grateful children that they expected to receive were actually none of those things that, um, in particular, there was a lot of real like distress about the fact that the adolescent Jewish boys, many of whom had spent time in forced labor camps or even in concentration camps, um, did things like swear or smoke or um, refuse to accept the authority of foster parents, refuse to obey curfews. Um, par foster parents and the organizations that placed them also revealed confusion and they were bewildered when these children did things like express anger, um, hoard food, wet the bed, engage in sexually promiscuous or compulsive behavior, steal from their host families. Um, and these same problems of, of, of being surprised by these behaviors in children repeated themselves with Hungarian adolescent boys, with Southeast Asian boys, um, and adolescents in general after Vietnam. Um, Cuban children brought during Operation Pedro Pan. Similarly, there was this, this process of, of surprise and, and dismay at these behaviors. Um, and there was a tendency, particularly with the two later groups, with Cuban and Southeast Asian children who were more visibly racialized, to attribute this to cultural factors, right? to say that the Cuban children behaved in these ways because they came from a culture where children were spoiled and emotionally unregulated and irrational. And in the case of Southeast Asian children, because they were duplicitous and um, inscrutable Orientals, right? So this is a pattern that we very much see in, in the archives. The second argument that I want to make is that American leaders, lawmakers, and child welfare workers have often also failed to recognize their own responsibility, or dare I say complicity, in exacerbating or creating trauma in unaccompanied children. And I argue that we have done this historically through both the creation of family separation, which often, but not always, leads to trauma in children, as well as the bureaucratic mismanagement and neglect of children after resettlement. Oh, sorry, let me go back there. Uh, beginning with the first officially recognized program to bring European Jewish children to the U.S. in the 1930s, U.S. immigration law and administration enforcement mechanisms have worked to create the conditions where, for the separation of children from their parents. So in other words, to actually create new groups of unaccompanied migrant children. Um, U.S. laws and administrative policies that determine admissions based on our foreign policy and our domestic political considerations, rather than the protection needs of displaced people, have often led to situations where we barred the admission of parents in need of protection or of entire families in need of protection while creating workarounds that allowed the admission of small numbers of children, thereby requiring their separation from their parents. Separation has also, however, been created by the voluntary agency personnel themselves, the child welfare workers, who oftentimes chose to participate in and even to incentivize the separation of children when they believed, and this goes back to politics and race and class, right? When they believed that the material benefits of migration outweighed the potential negative psychological consequences. Now, Frederica will talk about the fact that other European nations also believed in separating children during the World War I and post-subsequent years. In the US, there was a particular um, enduring belief that resettlement 
in the U.S. Um, was desirable based on a confidence in the American way of life and in the material and moral and spiritual superiority of the middle-class American family, as well as in the racialized assumption that poor and minoritized children would be better off with those white middle-class American families. And so prioritizing the material abundance of the American middle-class family over the familial bonds of poor and non-white children. Of course, we know this dates back to the mid-1800s, to the orphan trains that separated urban immigrant Catholic children um, from their families and sent them to white middle-class rural families, um, in many cases in the Southwest. Similar assumptions also underlaid the placement of native children in residential schools, and then the prioritization of adoption of neglected um, native children with white middle-class families. However, even when, um, even when our laws and our agencies didn't actively create unaccompanied migrant children, bureaucratic mismanagement and neglect has also contributed to their trauma. We have consistently failed since the post-World War II period to anticipate ongoing flows of unaccompanied migrant children after situations of war and crisis. We continue today to treat them as an exception, the way that refugees themselves were imagined in the immediate post-World War II period as an exception, rather than as a structural component of all of the processes of displacement that we experience in the world, right? Um, this particular mindset continues to shape how we approach unaccompanied migrant children, and it limits our ability to respond to them. Um, despite the fact that many political leaders, government officials, children's advocates, and voluntary agency personnel since the 1930s participated in resettling more than one group of unaccompanied children, and most of them had knowledge of the previous programs from which presumably they could have drawn lessons about how to handle resettlement in the future. Um, and yet we continue to seem to be surprised each time we get a new wave of unaccompanied children and almost equally unprepared to care for them appropriately. Um, let's see. As a result of this, this has led time and time again to children being placed in precarious, frightening, and dangerous situations in refugee camps, reception centers, detention facilities, inappropriate, neglectful, and poorly screened foster placements, as well as the failure to anticipate or provide for the needs of children who we can expect that some of them might be traumatized, right? Um, okay. A few just sort of anecdotal examples from the archives, right? Um, let me see, who did I put on this slide? Right, so let's talk about the creation of separation. If you look at the picture in the upper right-hand corner, this is a group of unaccompanied Jewish children who were brought to the U.S. in 1939 by a couple, and their name is failing me right now, um, who themselves took it upon themselves to get visa waivers and bring this group of children. Um, the efforts to bring Jewish children to the U.S. pre-war and during the first couple of years of the war are remembered as a great act of mercy and humanitarianism, right? Okay, maybe for the people who actually worked around the law to go and bring those children, it was a gesture of humanitarianism. But it has to be remembered that it was our immigration law that barred the admission of Jewish families and parents, despite everything that we knew about the Anschluss, um, the you know, Kristallnacht, all of the things that were going on in Germany, and yet continued to rigorously enforce immigration law and make absolutely no accommodations for the overwhelming majority of Jewish people seeking to get out of uh, Germany and then later the rest of Europe, right? Other than a few visas that were available for highly skilled elite um, German academics and other highly trained professionals, most Jewish parents had no way to get to the US. And so the efforts to bring children, which were spearheaded by Jewish American um, community members, were seen as a way to at least attempt to save a few children, right? So our immigration law created the circumstances that produced this particular group of unaccompanied children. The same is true of the children that came as part of Operation Pedro Pan in 1960 after the Cuban Revolution. Um, these, The majority of these children, although 
The historical memory of this program is that children were sent by parents who wanted to protect their children from communist brainwashing. The historical record is, in fact, otherwise. There were a few hundred children that were sent in 1960 for those particular reasons. The program itself blew up in 1961 when the U.S. government stopped offering visa waivers to Cubans on the island that didn't have relatives in the U.S that could do their paperwork. But they did offer visa waivers to children. So children could come to the US and then become the family member in the US that could request a visa waiver, waiver for their parents, thereby initiating a process of chain migration on behalf of their parents. So again, we created that group of unaccompanied minors. Um, where am I? Southeast Asian children. So the, the Amerasian um, Homecoming Acts of 1980, uh, 1982 and 1987. Uh, the lower picture is a picture of some Southeast Asian Amerasian children. Um, the, the particular laws that allowed for the mixed race children of Southeast Asian women and American GIs to come to the US required those young people to immigrate alone and required their mothers to sign statements that they were disavowing any ability to claim immigration status based on their relationship with their child in the future. So again, created the need for uh, children to separate from their mothers in order to immigrate. That program has its basis in the 1948 Displacement Act, uh, Displaced Persons Act and the 1953 Refugee Relief Act, which similarly allowed European half-orphans to come to the U.S. as unaccompanied migrants. But again, their living parent had to sign a certificate of abandonment and forswear any claim on being able to immigrate through their relationship with their child, right? Okay, one final argument that I'm gonna make here, and this one I don't have a lot worked out yet, but hopefully I'll get this out in an article at some point. I'd like to argue that the history of unaccompanied child migration to the US reveals that there is a still uneasy and ongoing relationship between trauma and the idea of the other, right? Now, many of the authors who have written about the sort of genealogy of trauma have alluded to the ethnocentrism of our current understandings of trauma. Um, the relationship between trauma, stigmatization, and concepts of the other has also been implicit in the analysis of um, Fasan and Rechman, Lays, other people who have written about trauma, um, pointing towards the historical relationship between feminized notions of hysteria, um, the idea that synestrosis was something that immigrant workers suffered from, as well as um, colonial psychiatry that looked at the way, European colonial psychiatry, that looked at the way that North African Muslims um, were supposedly incapable of suffering trauma because racially they were not on the same level as Europeans, right? And so they could be um, conscripted into European wars and treated as cannon fodder. Um, so some of these things appear in the literature, but they're implicit. There has still been very little systematic interrogation about how changing notions of trauma have been influenced by and influence these shifting parameters of the other, right? Um, Fasan and Rechman in 2009 went so far as to claim that the inclusion of PTSD in the DSMR-3 in 1980 signified a complete reversal that made this formerly stigmatized condition of trauma into a legitimate condition um, that is suffered by normal people, that all, that all people who claim trauma should be viewed as credible, um, and that, that our recognition of trauma is simply our recognition of our shared humanity, right? Uh, <laughs> With all due respect to Fasan and Rechtman, who wrote a phenomenal book, when I look at the relationship between trauma and the history of unaccompanied child migration, I find this claim difficult to defend, right? Um, and so just, just to sort of point in that direction, I would, I would remind everyone that 1980, the year that, the, that PTSD entered the psychiatric lexicon, is also the year that the Refugee Act came out. Um, it's also the year that we created the Unaccompanied Refugee Minors Program. One minute, yeah. Um, 
But the year that we created the Unaccompanied Refugees Minors Program is also the year where we began, where we began splitting um, unaccompanied migrant children into two groups. The small group that were viewed as unaccompanied refugee minors who received foster care and sympathy and respect, and the overwhelming majority who still today are known as unaccompanied alien children, and in most cases are detained and summarily deported, right? Um, I would argue that the way that we understand trauma in children has a lot to do with how we divide unaccompanied refugee minors from unaccompanied alien children. My question is, who gets to be traumatized, right? These unaccompanied Southeast Asian Boat people, as they were known at the time, included many thousands of unaccompanied children who, after 1975, were repeatedly reviled in the U.S. media as well as by immigration officials as anchors, right? In the late 90s and early 2000s, largely as a result of celebrity advocacy, African former child soldiers received tremendous sympathy and empathy, well-deserved, and many of them were allowed to immigrate to the U.S. as unaccompanied refugee minors. What about Central American children that are forcibly conscripted into armed gangs? What about Colombian children forcibly pressed into paramilitary service? What about the Nicaraguan children that fled Nicaragua in order to avoid being conscripted into the military and were de detained and deported? Who gets to be traumatized, right? So my conclusion is that when we attempt to apply an intersectional and age-based analysis to the history of trauma, we reveal important gaps in the genealogy of trauma. And we see that we really need to grapple with the category of age as a central, central aspect of how we understand trauma. And that we really need to factor in issues of race, class, and other difference that are so fundamental to the way we understand who gets trauma and why and what we should do about it. And I will stop there. Uh, I'm like, wow, this is wonderful. <laughs> beautiful presentation, beautiful presentation. Thank you, Ruben. I don't know how to help them. Are we gonna... Have a question. Are we gonna go on to the answer or are we gonna ask questions? We're gonna well, go right on. Go on. Ruben's gonna be next. Yeah. Oh, okay, great. So many questions and comments. I mean, it's a, it's a wonderful, very profound presentation. Let me just make sure. Should I sit on the other side since this is everybody who's on the side is presenting? Does it matter? Uh, really? You are it's a not. great asset. To that side. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I wanted to hear, Chris. Okay. Well, uh, good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for the wonderful invitation. My name is Ruben Parra Cardona. Many R's in there because I'm a Mexican born. So for some reason, we love R's <laughs> and long names. Uh, um, I'm a professor in the School of Social Work, and I'm also area director for research in our Latino Research Institute here at UT. Mexican born and immigrant and um, naturalized citizen for the past five years after a 15 year struggle to become a citizen. Mm -hmm. That you all know how, how complicated that process is. And then you see me with uh, our UT attire as I, <laughs> we try to do uh, important work, uh, but today is a big day because it determines whether we go to a ball game or not. And so we need to have <laughs> mechanisms of compensation for all the situations we see in our work. So it's a pleasure being here. Thank you again for a beautiful presentation and all the amazing presentations. I, I think for us is uh, we develop a tunnel vision in the work that we do. And when you come to spaces like this to process, what is it that we're doing? Where are we coming from? And exactly what you were saying, sometimes I feel like a lone voice in my field in terms of talking about the nocentrism that I see in the practice that we do. It's so refreshing when you see other perspectives that call onto that to hold us accountable. So today I'm gonna talk uh, from, about trauma from a, a different angle. I'm gonna talk from the angle of intervention and what is that we are trying to do in uh, particular with uh, underserved Latinx, Latino uh, populations. And I use the terms Latinx, Latino for, uh, that's, that's another topic for conversation, but you will see me using those names. Uh, 
Now, my focus of research is the cultural adaptation of evidence-based parenting programs for a Latino population. So you would say, what happened to you, Ruben? It's a 15-year struggle, and then you are utilizing interventions or originally developed with your American populations for dissemination with Latino populations. So I'll tell you more about that journey. Has not was not easy in the beginning, but it's been a very rewarding experience. As an immigrant myself, I grew up in northern Mexico in the border with El Paso, Texas, in Chihuahua. So we have so many U.S. Uh, companies uh, based in Mexico. So growing up, I saw the production of cables that most of us use in our cars, clothing, uh, uh, so many aerospace and auto industry. But for me, the reality was that all those products and services were being uh, produced in Mexican soil at the expense of Mexican workers making $7 per day, but I could not afford any of those products and services because I had to come to the US to, to acquire the end product of that. And granted, we have a history of corruption and injustice in the country, but you see the international co-conspiracy in terms of how um, world economies work. So that was my wor world growing up. And as I came to pursue my graduate education, because um, even though I always identify as a rebel, I always have identified myself as a scientist as well. I always wanted to come to the U.S. to pursue my education. But when I come to the U.S., I see the reality of my people. I see them in the fields. I see them in construction. We just recently replaced our roof, and I told my daughters, well, uh, wait and see. The contractor is going to be white, and the crew is going to be all Latino in 110 degree weather. And exactly, that's the way it operates, right? But we don't talk about those realities. Uh, the U.S. is uh, the strongest economy in the world, but we don't talk about the mechanisms by which it has gotten there. So these images of the Bracero program, I always use in, this in my presentation, and why is it that we work with Latino population? Why is it that we have the rights and benefits that we have? Why is it that we have the strongest economy in the world? Well, it's because um, it's the utilization of many groups and in uh, Latinos have been uh, used as scapegoats in times of crisis, have been heavily recruited to re uh, uh, prevent the collapse of the U.S. economy. This was at the time of the U.S. World War, an active, active campaign to recruit Latinos. But nobody talks about that in terms of political upheaval, but we talk about the aliens who are illegally crossing our boundaries. And you all are very familiar with all that. So, But this is something that even in social work, I need to continuously repeat, because sometimes many of my colleagues said I, I was not aware of that which is dramatic when you think about the, the, the role that we have in intervention. So this is something I, I experienced, I think, the, not to this degree myself, but some points of connection. When you cross by land into the United States, you are secluded in, a, in an area like this, 100 families with their children standing, you have the immigration officers with bulletproof windows, and they make you stay there to give you your permission. And I will never forget my kids looking at me, why are they doing this to us? And uh, what do you do that to their kid? And you need to be standing them for four hours, you go to the toilet, there are no toilet papers, you need to provide that. And how do you explain those realities to your kid? At the end of the day, I knew the layers of privilege I have. I always had my visa as a student. I knew we were gonna cross, but you see these realities. And then you come here and you see the realities of the massive, massive demand for cheap labor. But we see the other side of the story that is the narrative that is used in political convenient ways. So you would say, why cultural adaptation? You must be rebel and you must be like, <laughs> ah, it's a uh, destroy the imperialistic approach uh, because uh, science works. And um, as a family therapist, I was very ineffective whenever families asked me, okay, my kids um, is yelling back at me. What do I say? What, wh what do I do? So you're feeling angry because, yeah, I feel very angry. So what do I do? So behind the anger, what else? I was so bad because I only was able to work on emotions. I was not able to work with the how to. Parent training is a science to how is it that we can do parenting in effective ways, in non-punitive ways, and emotionally nurturing ways. So the science of parenting challenge me with the reality of social justice as an immigrant. I myself was being asked to stand for four hours with my kids at an immigration point. And at the same time, I saw the science generated in the United States with mostly non-Latino Euro-American populations telling me that that was a huge avenue. 
And my internship was in the juvenile justice system for five years. And over and over and over, I was uh, subpoenaed to testify 20 trials. Only one trial, I represented a non-Latino kid, white kid with a private attorney uh, for smoking marijuana, got a probation term of four years. Every other single case with brown and black kids got a prison term of one to two years for similar offenses. So why cultural adaptation? Because I was desperate to find a way for kids not entering the system. I, as kids would say, once you enter this white system, you never get out and it determines your life. At that time, I had the fortune of uh, meeting these extraordinary parenting researchers. I attended, my supervisor saw me one time in live therapy and said, you connect very well, but when it comes to parenting, you're really bad. So I'm gonna send you to the best applied conference on parenting. He was, uh, it, it was extraordinary. And he always used his white privilege to open spaces for us. And it was a life-changing experience because it was a conference of just understanding the best parenting practices. And this, this study completely threw me away. What you see here is after 10 years of coding behavioral observations from parents and children, these two researchers, Marion Forgatch and Jerry Patterson, they coded for 10 years uh, parenting practices that led to youth adjustment and parenting practices that led to youth ma maladjustment and, and problematic behaviors. They coded 10 seconds of every interaction. So they would go in for seven hours and just observe family interactions. And the microcoding would be, ten, you can imagine the amount of work for 10 years. As a result of that, they developed the first uh, evidence-based parenting program that um, now has become like the gold standard for many of the parenting interventions that you see out there. What you see here is a randomized controlled trial in which families were offered a parenting prevention program that lasted 12 weeks. 250 families allocated to the intervention group, which is the red line. 250 families allocated to the control group with was treatment as usual. So these families with uh, adolescents with acting out problems where they refer to insight-oriented approaches, psychoanalysis, kind of like the stuff I was trying to do that was very ineffective. What is remarkable about this, the federal government, the National Institute of Health funded this study for nine years, not only the randomized phase of the study, but the follow-up. And what they found was remarkable. The probability of arrest of the kids in the families whose parents were exposed to that intervention was significantly lower, you see that in red, compared to the probability of arrests of kids exposed to the control. It meant this is a strong intervention and it works. And not only that, parents per capita increase, parents' depression significantly decrease, parents' uh, substance use behaviors decrease. It was the whole family unit improve as a result of that parenting intervention. There's no a single study that is the randomized phase plus, uh, plus nine years of follow-up. Those kids were four through 12. Now the sample was a majority of your American kids and when I saw this, I was, we need to test this for, for our families because as a family therapist, I was working here. So the kids I was working, um, all of them had charges of aggravated assault, drug, um, um, uh, trafficking drugs, trafficking arms, kidnapping. I mean, we were working with very intense uh, cases. But how do you get into, I was in this process of also being an immigrant and being denigrated by immigration authorities, right? I was asked in order for my immigration case to proceed to get letters from every continent in the world saying that there were no Latino researchers working with Latino immigrants. So I had to write to China and say, do you have Latino researchers doing my work? <laughs> and, uh, and they were like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and uh, is this immigration system, oh, okay, that makes sense. No, we don't. And, and they would write, so can you imagine to all the continents having to do that? It was a process that it was so painstaking. So I was in this struggle like, okay, I see this data that is so powerful and we need it for our people, but how is it that we do these without falling into scientific imperialism? So as a therapist, I was thinking, well, what do you do well as a therapist? You join with a family system, you learn their life experiences, and then you intervene. So for two years, we uh, conducted a qualitative study in the Latino immigrant in community, community in Detroit. That I was affiliated with the Michigan State University for 15 years. That's where I launched this study. And we just conducted a, a qualitative study to learn about the life experiences and to learn about their needs. And this study was incredibly important because it really informed how we had to work. 
when we ask the question, and we said, this was a, a quote represents a, a dominant theme. What, I, what is discrimination like for you when you are a Latino? What, what discrimination is like? And this father was so uh, passionate about the way he describes this with a lot of pain. Discrimination is a bitter drink that you need to swallow. You have to swallow it because you say, if I get rebellious or do not behave, they can throw me into jail or they won't help me. Jail code word for immigration authority in detention and deportation. So you just have to swallow that drink. So it was not like it's gonna get better. It's not like I have a different future. You have to swallow it. You have to suck it up because it's gonna get better for my kids, not for me. So if you go into a parenting program and you paint a rosy picture about their situation of injustice, you can create more harm rather than help. And that was very helpful because this was very hard data that we collected, but that informed our adaptation process. But at the same time, as you were talking about resilience, which I love the way you presented it, with all these uh, perspective of life, parents were so happy in the, in, the, in the focus groups and parents were so happy about their lives. Say, I have a roof, I have food, and I have a future secure for my kid. I know they will go to college. I know they will have dreams that I never had. Latino values is to instill in your children to be respectful of others. It goes in the blood what your parents teach you. The sense of resilience, of fighting adversity is something that continues to amaze me to this day. Uh, my best friend teaches in Mexico. He has a, a master's degree, an MBA from the United States in a public university, full-time job, 16 courses per semester and gets paid $400 per semester, per, 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 per month. Can you believe that? And I'm like, I'm complaining because I cannot buy out a course. <laughs> and I'm like, oops, how are you doing? Oh, it's great. They gave me another course for Saturday. That's good, you know, for party. And I'm like, and, and that's the kind of like the sense of resilience that uh, our people bring. But at the same time, as Anita was presenting, is our, uh, the story for our people is about living in the shadows. You have this critical contribution to the United States, but we don't want you to have a place. We don't want you to have a narrative. We don't want you to have rights. 98% of the parents we work with uh, do not have insurance, cannot afford parenting services by paying by themselves. So conveniently in the United States, in this country that we love, but we struggle with, we know this is a structure that historically has been develop in a very sophisticated way. Um, as, a, as a rebel, I always said, how am I going to do this? And um, uh, one of my friends said, you need to frame it in a scientific way. And I say, but how am I going to use monies from the United States to do this? I'm going to be a conspirator and all that. You know all that struggle, <laughs> right? He like, uh, and he was just looking at me. He's an engineer and like, are you done? Just get the money and demonstrate you can make a difference. And like, okay, okay. And I have to say, I'm so grateful to the National Institute of Health. For 15 years, they have funded our work with undocumented immigrants, knowing that 98% of our sample is undocumented. And actually, they coach me on how to write certain sections of the proposal that they know will go to uh, a higher level of revision with people that may not be that happy knowing that taxpayers' money goes to immigrants. Uh, but they have helped me on this from a scientific stance, is find a scientific question to this. And this is how we have done our work. Uh, my premise was, my hypothesis was that if we inform parenting interventions according to critical theories that help parents live the reality, like critical race theory, in terms of naming discrimination, how to cope with discrimination, and how for them to better cope with that and provide them with resources, we can make a difference. And at the same time, la cultura cura is how can we elevate con a cultural experiences and strengths in their lives. So what you see here is a cultural adapted design. The, at that time when I got funded, uh, the funding agencies were getting a lot of requests for cultural adaptation. It's a cultural adapted group compared to control, what are we going to find? And the problem, talking with the division directors, because, you know, I would go with division directors. It's like your institute and this. And I know, I know, Ruben, but you need to look things from my perspective. Give me a model. Give me a model that demonstrates that cultural adaptation is relevant. So one day I was running at the treadmill. Is how do we get to this? And I saw an announce, uh, a TV commercial of three apples and three colors. And I say, that's what we need. If we need to demonstrate that overly addressing discrimination in mental health intervention works, we need to compare and contrast. So rather than a two design, I said we need two levels of adaptation. 
One level that is a very good adaptation, but only stays at the level of language, metaphors, and images. And another level that is a deep structural adaptation in which we infuse in the, the intervention with a lot of content from those focus groups. So in this, in this intervention, we start by having conversations with parents about immigration, the immigration adversity they experience. Throughout the intervention, we have, we tied uh, discrimination to the parenting components, and at the end, we close by uh, providing uh, skills to parents on biculturalism. So, for example, in that group, before we do a lot of role plays, your kid yell back at you. So, let me show you a way in which I would respond. Before doing that, we say, "But tell me about your day." Then the father says, "Well, I woke up at four in Michigan. I'm at the Home Depot at five. You go out to our Home Depots five, six in the morning. That's where people stop and hire workers without contracts, right? So I'm there standing for one hour. I go through the day. I only get." one break in the day, the white people get three breaks and everybody's calling me a wet back during the day and at the end of the day I get paid eight hours and I go to the employer and say, I work 13 hours and he said, I, I can deport you right now, I can denounce you to immigration authority right now and I can give you a job tomorrow, what do you want? So at that moment that parent is completely uh, overwhelmed with reactivity and, 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 and all the distress and the trauma from that exploitation. So we ground the parent in that moment, we ground parents in the moment, we do a number of things uh, from an intervention perspective, and then we move with the intervention. For all the families that we work, all of them receive case management services. So uh, for many of them, we know that it will be very hard to uh, file an immigration petition, but for example, we move them from exploitative employers to more employers that we know care about immigrants and know how to work with the system better. So every family going through our program do not only receive parenting programs, but receive advocacy in case management. So here comes the randomized trial, right? And uh, what is it that we learn from parents exposed to a traditional adaptation to an in-depth adaptation? Well, what you see on the left are measurements of our groups, uh, are designed with immigrant families with children ages four through 12, and the three conditions, the control condition, the waitlist control condition, the surface level adaptation, and the deep structure adaptation. With regards to parenting practices, what we saw here was that regardless of the groups, parents benefited from the intervention. Parents in both groups increased the quality of their parenting practices. But the groundbreaking finding was that the, in the deep structure adaptation, the child mental health significantly improved. So we see a reduction of internalizing symptoms like depression, anxiety, and externalizing symptoms like uh, oppositional behavior. I had to restrain myself from talking from the with the data analyst for like a year because I really want that slope to be the lowest one. And he said, do not touch my data. And I'm like, but no, no. And I'm like, okay, you know, you know. So, okay, I'm, I'm gonna remove myself because I was freaking out. What if the slopes didn't show anything? When, when we write, it's like, really, you don't want a bonus? And, uh, and when you look at the qualitative data, parents, the way it's say, is just I connected the dots. I don't have much power in many situations. I get yelled at work, I get exploited, I get paid eight hours and then 12, but I get home and I have a lot of power and I take on that with my wife and with my kids. So they connected the external oppression to the reality of their home and thank God we were able to find a way to break those chains of oppression. And um, that work really propelled us to the national and international conversation because it's one of the very few, and I attribute this to our team, to our team made this possible, to demonstrate the importance of overtly addressing discrimination in mental health services. So just in wrapping up, I would like another couple of lessons learned. Uh, we work a lot with transgenerational trauma and contextual trauma, and I really thank you for going in that depth because there's confusion first amongst ourselves. Chronic stress stress is not the same as trauma, so we need to have that conversation. And then really what's the history of trauma, and then most importantly, how do we address trauma? Um, so we work with two types of trauma. A lot of the contextual trauma has been uh, discussed here in terms of the history of migration of our parents, um, but also the transgenerational trauma. 
we have we had a father who was really tough in parenting groups you know one that always challenged me and one father that you say oh my gosh he showed up again and that you want him to show up but at the same time you're not making me look competent so it's like right but when we got uh, to the point of limit setting and discipline and he told his story he said every time i misbehave i grew in a little village in mexico where the cartels constantly recruit adolescents. So my dad was very tough on me because the cartels are not going to take you and you're going to be tough. But whenever I misbehave, he would take me to the shower and hit me. He would bring five cables of different diameter and start hitting me. And the more I cried, the more he used the cables with a bigger diameter. And everything I remember is just being in the cold shower with the blood. And that was my upbringing. So when I see my kid misbehaving, I want to be my, my, like my father. I don't know how to change that because the world is tough. They are going to call him wetback. They are going to call him names. How do I protect him? So that's the kind of transgenerational trauma we work with. And something about good news, I know we've talked about difficult stuff. The good news is uh, for all, all the time in 15 years, I always have seen how parents working through parenting can heal, can heal themselves and can heal their children from those experiences. So this paper is very close to my heart. I'm very happy to send it your way. And you will see it's the only sole author publication that I have, because we all publish as a team. But the editor said, no, you've been reflecting on this a lot for a long time. Can you publish this by yourself? And it's about the premise that through parenting, many layers of trauma can be healed. And that a, a has been a missed opportunity because I think with trauma can be so overwhelming that we feel only trauma-focused intervention is the way. No, there are so many ways in which we intervene that can promote that healing. And this is a reflection of, remember this father that I told you about the cables? I used to say that our children were the ones with the problem, but I realized that if we are doing things wrong, they will do things wrong as well. It's about learning that our children are only the reflection of our actions. So powerful because is you never tell a parent you're doing things wrong. You say, oh, let me show you a different way of doing things. And parents engage in this reflection process. And this is very powerful as well. I learned to see the chains of education we have from our parents and how we want to do the same. They made us do things and one on TV didn't look, but communication and respect better. My old ways were wrong and now I'm closer to my daughter. So this is a beautiful quote because um, I'm talking about the transgenerational drama in the parenting of, in the context of parenting and how oppressive parenting is related to oppressive context. And I think closing that gap has been essential in our group. So as we made strides and started to figure out how to do this work, we have Trump's election and it's like a huge setback. We had to reconsider everything we were doing from doing parenting programs in open spaces. We went to the basements of churches because in the basement of churches, we know Homeland Security would not hit us and hit our parents. Uh, but we had to have surveillance systems two days before our parenting group to see if there was any um, uh, activity by immigration authorities. And I had to cross the line and, and the, that I had established before for myself and start working with law enforcement and say, hey, we care about our communities. And this is what we're trying to do. So we had some important allies there. But we were faced with tremendous, um, uh, a tremendous context that um, in, in the context of Latino immigration had not seen with that level of intensity and so rapid and so systematic. And we started to gather data that we had not gathered before. My son was bullied by classmates at school because of my name again. It got to the point of him saying that he wanted to die. From doing parenting, acting out behavior, we got to manage suicidal ideation, suicidal attempts alongside with our parenting programs. But as we've been talking about the challenges, we have also been talking about resilience. After talking with my daughter about immigration, she told me, mom, I'm going to be a social worker when I grow up. There are too many injustices against Latinos in this country. I want to help. It, this is a difficult quote. You want this, a 13-year-old, to be a 13-year-old. But at the same time, there's a ray of resilience there that you see and is the complexity of the realities that we work with us. In closing, I would like to say that despite how difficult the context is with trauma, um, 
the, the first thing is we really need to understand trauma. And for that, I want to help each and every one of you who have presented and uh, the way in which you are helping us reflect about this. And we need to also have a critical analysis to uh, understand who has defined trauma and who has defined the dominant theories of trauma that involve our work. As an immigrant, everything I always question myself is about imperialism and the way imperialism has permeated in the domain of trauma is present as well by the frameworks we have, by the way we understand it, and by the way we intervene. But at the same time, there are many rates of light that we can do in the day and day experiences of parents. One of my friends, the engineer, the one that told me, just get the damn data. Mm -hmm. uh, he told me, You're, the intervention you work is so beautiful because the common sense is the least common of the senses. And he's like, w in the midst of all these chaos, what can you offer to these families that offer so much to us to them in their daily lives. They wake up with their kids, they need to raise their kids, how can we help them? And um, word of hope, the United States may be the strongest economy in the world, but we have not figured out a lot of things and our Latin American folks are figuring out. In, in Chile now we're nationwide with our parenting program and it's because a private foundation embrace the commitment to promote mental health. And they say, we are gonna give this legacy to children. So they have, fully funded a program of prevention services research based on evidence-based interventions that are culturally relevant. And in Chile, I can tell you, it's a beautiful example of how the private sector um, embraces a challenge to make a difference and how they uh, maintain this process of growth growing with some signatures with government, with us as international actors. So when I look at Chile, it's an invitation for us as the United States to stop thinking so much about us and our models and our frameworks and what is it in the world that is happening that we can learn from and become better. Great to read that. Thanks a lot for the invitation. I'm really honored and pleased to be here and to learn so much uh, with the talks this morning already. So what I would like to do today, so I'm going back in the past, and what I would like to do is I would like to bring in the current war of Russia against uh, children, uh, uh, against Ukraine and its impact on the children in Ukraine. And I would like to link it to my own research in the First World War and its aftermath. So, and I would like to figure out what kind of parallels can we draw from the past to the present and what co conclusions can we offer. So the broader question I would like to deal with when looking at the past and present is the question of how children's displacement, be it voluntary or forced, during periods of war and multiple crises, affect and affected children in the past and what consequences it had on children's mental well-being and on their life courses. How can we historicize the often fundamental disruptions to children's mental well-being caused by displacement? And how can we as historians incorporate children's inner worlds and emotional responses into our research? So I would like to look back at the experiences of Ukrainian children in the past half a year. Since February 24th, we have been witnesses to the migration of by now more than two and a half million children fleeing from Russia from Russia's attack on Ukraine. Most of them become witnesses of violence during the war. Many saw their loved ones injured. Many have seen their fathers leave for the front. When leaving their country, they lost their known lives, their secure home, their social environments, their well-known neighborhoods, their daily routines. When fleeing, most children had to leave their fathers behind. And when fleeing, children are particularly vulnerable, especially when, par especially when parental protection is no longer possible. Unaccompanied children are exposed to violence, the risk of exploitation and child trafficking. Many children went missing in the past months. In the past few months, also between 200 and 300,000 Ukrainian children have become victim to Russia's genocidal method of forced deportations to Russia. While this method is considered a serious war crime, according to the Geneva Declaration, Russia uses these deportations to Russify these children and to erase their Ukrainian identity. Especially children from Ukrainian orphanages, uh, of which over 50% are disabled. So you posed the question about disablement. 
uh, are particularly vulnerable to being lost and or deported. But even if children from Ukraine are just displaced to secure countries, they face major challenges. Most displaced children are exposed to stress, experience anxiety, have trouble coping with the massive disruptions to their private lives. And we are not psychologists, we are historians. How do we deal with that? In the receiving countries, many children are expected to adapt fast, to behave, to integrate well into new schools, new kindergartens, and new cultural environments. But as we saw in the earliest talk today, they often misbehave and don't do what is expected from them. Many cannot communicate with their surrounding as they don't speak the language. Yet, children's resilience enables children to cope with the challenges of displacement. But I would like to ask, at what cost do these children adapt to the new environments? So this is a present situation of children in and from Ukraine today. When we look at the current crisis, I think it is worth to look back 100 years and see how the aftermath of the First World War forced children to migrate or to be evacuated be it either in response to war and territorial loss or as a response to hunger, destitution and suffering. And I know the inherent problems to compare these different types of migration. Still, I think it's worth to look at how these different types sort of affected children. So I've been working on children's uh, displacement and unaccompanied evacuation in, uh, and from, uh, to and from Budapest. So I look through the lens of Budapest at, at the post-war period. So I looked at uh, how the war and the dissolution of the Austro-Hungarian Empire caused the mass migration of around half a million Hungarians from the lost territories and what challenges children faced when they arrived after their migration to Budapest. Many children could not be housed properly in their new surroundings. Thousands of displaced families were stranded at the train stations of Budapest and were accommodated for months in cattle wagons. I argue in my book, Budapest Children, that the massive migration caused not just children's dislocation, but also their uprootedness and their loss of a home. And that still figures as a big topic up to today. So I think uh, nobody really dealt with this collective trauma in Hungary. And we see what kind of consequences and implications it has still on today's Hungarian society. So... One Hungarian girl, so these are the cattle wagons here on the right side. You see where they were housed, not only for weeks, for months as well. So one Hungarian girl named Ellen recalls in 1922 how she experienced her forced displacement from territories that were lost to Hungary and her life in Budapest. Perhaps I'm much too young to write my life story. It is true that I have only lived a few years, but my life has had variety enough. We had to leave Transylvania. We arrived at Budapest. Here we suffer very much. At home, I possessed everything my heart could desire. Here, I have not even gotten a warm room. What she describes here are the material and physical losses she experiences due to her displacement. But her life story is just one out of many. What I could identify as a possible impact of displacement and evacuation on children, uh, on children, children after their forced displacement experienced the loss of their previous life and their homes, often living in an insecure housing situation in the recipient country, facing the consequences of parents' abrupt unemployment, loss of their former social standing. Many of them were uh, belonging to the better off classes of Hungarian society. They would sort of uh, experience an abrupt uh, impoverishment, uh, abrupt social decline. Children also experienced deep, uh, disrupted family ties. Many became half orphaned or simply lost contact to their parents during migration. Most displaced children in Budapest were also exposed to hunger and malnutrition. Uh, suffered from cold and neglect. They could not attend school, so it fits. So displacement, education, health, all are also interconnected as problems at the time. They couldn't attend school either because they had to take up new roles or, for instance, the lack of shoes. That's a big topic at the time because of the lack of shoes, they couldn't walk to the school. 
Due to the precarious housing situation in the insanitary living conditions in the poverty dwellings, the Raybok cars or the refugee barracks in Budapest, children faced a greater likelihood to suffer from <clears throat> epidemic diseases such as tuberculosis or contract the Spanish flu. And most importantly, I would argue a displacement forced children to grow up very fast. The migrant child, Ellen, concluded her life story with the words, perhaps I'm much too young. It's true that I had lived only a few years, but my life has had variety enough. So her experiences during the war, her displacement in the post-war period, which I consider a period of multiple crises, just as today, resulted in an accumulation of experiences that would many today consider not childlike. So I also studied children's evacuations from Budapest to the countryside and to foreign countries in the post-war period. Around 50,000 Hungarian children, and it's not just a Hungarian story, one could write a story of uh, child migration and child evacuations in various post-war and post-crisis periods. Um, but I think it's, it's a telling ground, a telling story about what evacuations do with children in the post-World War period. So around 50,000 children were sent for some weeks, also for some months, others stayed for years or for good, never returned home. So I found lists of these children departing from Hungary and mostly departing from Budapest, and there are lots of gaps uh, in the dates when children should have returned. Um, very difficult to trace the individuals, but it's uh, so I conducted a number of interviews uh, of people, of, of children who remained within the families where they were sent to. Um, so while the aim was to secure children's physical survival and better nutrition, children's displacement had also long-term problematic implications on children's lives themselves. Children's abrupt and often longer-term disintegration from their birth families and countries often altered their overall identities and belonging. Iboya, which is here now, a Hungarian girl who participated in the evacuation program, recalled in an interview the impact of her evacuation on her familial relationship to her birth family. She speaks here about her foster family in Holland. I was like their own child. Actually, I don't know what kind of upbringing I got because a lot of people loved me but not the way a mother can love her. When I came home, I loved my mother, but not like a real mother, because this childhood was missed until I was 12. Her narrative touches on her harmed relationship to her birth mother, which caused discomfort and feelings of alienation. Many evacuated children lost the ability to speak their mother tongue, uh, and they struggle to maintain their birth identity. Because in a child's life, half a year or even two years, they matter far more than in the lives of adults. So time has a very different um, impact uh, on children. So I argue in the book that children's displacement caused disrupted family ties and harmed social relationships. Many talk immensely a lot, a lot about the uh, stay abroad and they loved it and they ate the Belgian chocolate and they had great relationships with their families abroad, their foster families. So all these narratives are often very positive, but when they start to talk about their reintegration in their, into their birth families mm -hmm. and their own families, then I felt like, wow, something is not really right here because it is sort of a very imbalanced story. On the one hand, this idealized, which fits this humanitarian endeavor at the time, this idealized notion of the stay abroad and then that dark story about, oh, I had to return and at the train station, I wouldn't recognize my mom. I wouldn't speak the language. They had to employ an uh, translator so that I would relearn the language. So then, then you, so I, I wonder, and I think that would be perhaps something that we could later talk about, is that uh, they, they, they wouldn't misbehave. They would behave, but still, I think some of them experience trauma. So that would be something I would be interested in. So, um, so it caused children's cultural disintegration and made their repatriation and reintegration after the return pretty difficult. While children's evacuation was long considered the best way to secure children's survival, and I, I don't question that, 
It was only in response to the massive child evacuations of World War II that critical voices emerged which would address the difficult repercussions of children's separation from their uh, birth families. Anna Freund, Dorothy Burlington, etc., John Bowlby published on the impact of children's separation on their attachment, which resulted in wider reflections on the impact of children's displacement on children's mental well-being. But it was only in 1989, and I'm happy to learn if there was something in between. I already asked that at the first dinner, when Article 9 um, of the Declaration of the Rights of the Child stated that, quote, a, chi a child shall not be separated from his or her parents against their will, except when such a separation is necessary for the best interest of the child. So how did the first declaration from 24, where it's only about feeding and taking care of the kids, result in finally acknowledging that children should not be separated from their birth families? Except in the best interest of the child. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> who, decides, <laughs> who decides on the best interest of the child? Not the child. Not the child. <laughs> so here we are again today witnessing the massive unaccompanied displacements of children from Ukraine, this time not as a mis uh, means of humanitarian relief, but as a means of Russia's warfare. So now I'd like to respond to the question asked by the organizers of how children's experiences differed from adults and what long-term consequences for children's identity, uh, identity we can identify. I con consider this question a very uh, essential question, as it helps us to uncover the particularities of children's experiences in the past and perhaps also in the present. I'm not sure if that's readable. Uh, one would need glasses, I guess. First of all, I would like to identify what experiences displaced children in the past shared with their parents. I think it was a, the, it was a, ways, it was a way in which war and displacement disrupted their private lives. Both parents and children experienced disintegration from their communities, disrupted relationships, discontinued routines, a stable place at home and within their social communities. So this is something that affects the adults and the children. Both of them lost their friends, their known neighborhoods and their daily lives as they knew them. So how did children's suffering and displacement differ from adult suffering? I would argue that it was especially children's need of protection, care, feeding, education, which made and possibly still makes them more vulnerable than adults in times of war, crisis, etc. Especially in times of war and displacement, it becomes striking how dependent and how embedded children's lives were and still are. If adults lose their countries of birth, their homes, their jobs, their social networks, children are exposed to abrupt and massive changes, which they have no influence over, which results in their particular vulnerability. And I, I, I don't really like to talk about children as passive objects, but I think when there are these times of a radical political upheaval, transformation, that is the moment when children become really passive because they are so dependent on, on help, on care. Um, so not even the most basic needs of care, warmth, food and attention could be met in the post-war period. So wars and displacement in the past made it difficult or even impossible for parents to make sure that their children kept on living their daily lives according to their norms of a childlike and secure upbringing. I don't want to judge what a childlike life is supposed to be, but the parents had an idea of what the children should live like. And there was a huge disappointment and disillusionment of, no, I am unable to uh, provide for my children the lives I would have wanted them to experience. Um, so simply to provide the children with a warm room, as you saw in these cattle cars, was a major challenge when they arrived to Budapest. So lots of the children got sick, uh, got uh, uh, starving, etc. So ma many children, if affected by war, migration, displacement, hunger, could no longer just remain the familial child and the kindergarten or the school child. They had to take up roles that often stood in stark contrast to their previous lives and to their lives as children. This is particularly the case because many of these children belong to the upper classes, better off classes. So they were supposed to go to school and kindergarten be cared for. I'm not saying that that's the case with all children, but those, that group of migrants, they had a different type of life before their migration. 
Um, so I, I counted many stories, stories and images of children queuing in uh, food and bread lines in the city uh, while their parents went to work. So children's emotional and mental well-being could often no longer be properly, properly secured. Children suffered in the post-World War period from neglect, so they were often left in these cattle cars for throughout the days because the parents had to go off for work, inappropriate care, loss of family members, etc. Expressions of children's own experiences reveal how traumatic experiences of displacement were and how little they really actually understood what happened to them. Many simply wished themselves back to their previous lives, uh, be it in Transylvania or the ceded territories. However, and here comes resilience, children in the past were not always just poor, little, traumatized children. Dis displaced children often also showed resilience, adapted sometimes easier and better than the older generation to their new environments, and sometimes navigated times of abrupt change better than their parents. They could learn the languages faster, uh, integrate better. Still, I think uh, it's always, some children did it, some didn't. And I think that's something we might discuss. What, what helps children to navigate periods of crisis and trauma? So what strategies were successful back then to offer displaced children a way out of their suffering and trauma. In Budapest, it was the initiative of, of the so-called work rooms, which Julia Weika, a humanitarian child relief worker, opened in the poverty dwellings of Budapest with the financial help of the Save the Children. She considered already back in the 1920s education the best means of relief than simply feeding the children. So she trained the children to, um, to be capable to learn a trade so that they could provide for their families. And it's funny because it's work, and, but it's also education. It's a shift away from child labor to education and sort of providing them an ability to uh, earn their own living and support their families. This leaves me to ask, how can children today be protected when facing displacement? How can especially orphans and other institutionalized children, as we see today in uh, Ukraine, be protected from unaccompanied displacement or deportation? And how can we keep the memory of children's experiences of displacement in the past kept alive so that not the same mistakes are made when children face periods of multiple crises, such as today, when a health crisis is met with a climate crisis and a war? Thank you very much. We're going to have to postpone all of our discussion of these incredible papers until the end. Joanna, you'll be next to speak. Can you hear me? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> it's wonderful to be here, and thank you to the organizers to invite me. Um, just as a way of introducing myself, I'm a social and cultural historian of East European Jewish history and the Holocaust, and I have worked on the reconstructions of Jewish children's experiences in the aftermath of the Holocaust. And one of the key areas that I'm after is the reconstruction of the world of being, feeling, and thinking through the children's testimonies, early post-war testimonies and children's drawings. And I consider this material uh, as texts and images that voluntarily and non-voluntarily or involuntarily reveal personal perceptions, emotions, and ascriptions of the meaning what had befell their altars in the course of the Holocaust. And in my work, I'm also uh, after uh, capturing children's agency, li even limited agency in children as young as eight years or nine years old, uh, since these children grew up so fast. And similarly to the German historian of Alta Geschichte, Dorothy Wierling, I argue that as historians, we have to accept that subjective narratives are our main evidence to reconstruct the world of being, feeling, and thinking of children. And we need to develop more sophisticated way of listening to these voices and to reading critically, reading those voices. And we also have to 
uh, adapt, make a, a use of interdisciplinary approaches, including psychological approaches. For me, for example, Jonathan's um, a lecture yesterday was fascinating. But what I want to do today with you, I want to share with you some of my uh, reflections about the use of references to children's refugees uh, from the 1930s and 1940s in the current refugee crisis. Of course, I'll be talking about the public discourse, and I see the use of these references in the public discourse as a miss missing lesson from the Holocaust, as an illustration of our inability to deal with complex traumatic histories, shining away from those histories. So hence, 2014, the refugee crisis in Europe and beyond has triggered invocation of young Jewish survivors from the Holocaust in public discussions about the plight of young refugees of war and genocide of the 21st century. On 25th August 2016, in the New York Times, Nicholas Kristof contented in a forceful way that history rhymes and today, to our shame, Anne Frank is a Syrian girl. Kristof and other writers, children's rights activists and liberal politicians in the United States and the, in the United Kingdom, including former Jewish refugees and their descendants, invoked the fate of Jewish refugees in the 1930s as a cautionary tale about the consequences of indifference and inaction in the world of community today. They make references to Jewish child survivors with an urgent humanitarian goal in mind. And of course, as we all know, this goal is met only very partially, regrettably. However, public discussions invoking young Jewish survivors are rather of limited scope and vague nature. While they focus on governmental policies and practices, and individual adult approaches towards young refugees in the 1930s and the 1940s, and now they pay little attention to the voices of child survivors themselves, then and now. The public discussions don't touch complicated individual and familiar histories of young Jewish survivors and their intergenerational families for understanding the current social and educational work with child refugees and their future. The discussion lacks specific comparisons utilizing child survivors' voices from the 1940s and the present to show commonalities and differences in the experiences of young refugees from the Second World War and the 21st century. For example, in the BBC report of 17 December 2019 about the refugee camps on the Greek island Lesbos, we could see young Syrian refugees from a war zone who, in the words of a child psychologist working in the camp, do not want to live any longer. A wish to die expressed by young children reveals the desperate mental state these children are in. But viewing this report and many alike, we would not necessarily learn that not wanting to continue on living was not an atypical experience among full orphan child survivors emerging from the Holocaust and also child survivors emerging from the South genocide in Cambodia or Rwanda. I'm also a great advocate for comparative studies of those experiences. So some young Polish Jewish uh, sur uh, survivors contemplated or attempted suicide in Jewish children's home in Poland on the way to the new homelands in the P camps in the American and British zones in post-1945 partition Germany. The survivors recall such drastic episodes from their lives in the early post-war testimonies when they were still children and could not contemplate fully what they experienced and as mature individuals. They speak matter of fact about about the arrival of dark foes in a fragile moment when they felt totally overwhelmed by the feelings of the loss of their families and by traveling raw memories of wartime experiences ranging from physical to mental and sexual mistreatment by those who were supposed to protect them. Some Jewish children 
in Nazi German occupied Poland contemplated death as a best solution to their plight while in hiding in the care of what I call in, in my research on rescuers. I'm writing a history of rescue of, child, uh, of Jewish children in Poland. I call these rescuers, this particular group of rescuers here. I, you have one examples of such a rescuers, a rescuers, abusers and rescuers perpetrators. The memory of these traumatic, drastic experiences have become an intrinsic part of their identities and their individual memories. They reveal deep mental wounds, raptures, messiness, and complexities of individual and familial lives in the aftermath without reducing their lives to the Holocaust experience. And of course, my position is also not a reductionist position. So why is there a little public attention paid to these accounts, given that we have at our disposal an impressive and still growing library of scholarly studies about the Holocaust and other genocides, and also an immense archives of testimonies, including drawings that have not even been analyzed. So do we as scholars actually fail in disseminating the knowledge, our research to the public? And one of the reasons that I believe uh, stands behind this, the current situation of rejecting this uh, knowledge is that one uh, that we, the, we do not incorporate such accounts into public discussions about child refugees today because of the post-1945 legacies of memorialization of Jewish child survivors. The reassuring and sentimentalizing narratives of, narratives of Jewish child survivors, a smiling, physically and mentally resilient children, like our own regular children, were created and deployed in the immediate aftermath of the Holocaust to fulfill various political, psychological, cultural and social needs and goals and expectations on a national level and transnational levels. And there is quite a lot of work done uh, regarding this topic. Images of smiling and healthy child survivors proliferated on posters and humanitarian aid photographs published in the general Western press and Jewish press alike, both Zionist and socialist Jewish press. The accompanying, reassuring and sentimentalizing narratives avoided mentioning the fundamental raptures and messiness in the wartime and early post-war biographies of child survivors had kept at a safe emotional distance the direct immediate, immediate impact of wartime wounds upon the reconstruction of families, mental and cultural challenges in adjusting to new social and cultural life in children who um, had to move to new homelands, and many instances of felt adoptions and social isolation of the young survivors within reconstructed Jewish families or non-Jewish families. Of course, we can argue that the renewal and sentimentalizing narratives are one-dimensional and exclude many biographies of Jewish child survivors. They, contra they actually contradict medical research on childhood exposed to physical and emotional maltreatment and neglect experience even in peacetime societies and the long-term consequences of that maltreatment and neglect. Those including historians, sociologists and social workers who intimately work with aging Jewish child survivors recognize the long-term consequences of the wartime wounds and oppose smothering sentimentalization of public memory of the Holocaust. Yet sentimentalization and renewal narratives are persistent. And of course, the post-war British uh, memorialization culture of the Holocaust is a good uh, uh, example of the continuity of that approach of renewal and sentimentalization. So here that the key main aspects that I'm presenting to you uh, from the British uh, case, child survivors from the war-torn European continent were treated as a symbol of renewal and redemption. 
and quick assimilation into the middle class. British society, adolescent survivors are portrayed as serious studies, neatly dressed, physically and mentally healthy and eager to learn a new trade. And of course, the wartime traveling and painful experiences and agency of youth uh, of the survivors were rather marginalized at the expense of the narratives of Anglo-Jewish heroes and saviors. And one of the most striking examples of the continuation of, uh, of memorialization of child survivors is that beautiful film. I don't know if you had the chance to see The Windmere Children, which is a beautiful um, a BBC dramatization of Windmere Children, which was shown on the evening of 27 January 2020, the International Holocaust Day. So the renewal narratives runs underpins the whole film, but it's also reinforced at the end of the film when the real five male Polish Jewish survivors, today respected, well-established British professional and feminine men, are depicted in the scenery of the Windmere Lake where they were recuperated in the summer and fall of 1945. And a similar renewal and uh, sentimentalizing narrative has been presented in another exhibition, One Family, Three Cities, Six Years of War, by the Wiener Library, the first Holocaust Library in Europe, as, as it defines itself. I don't have the time to talk about this exhibition at the moment, uh, but you can ask me uh, about it if you if you wish, in the discussion. But the depictions of the child survivors in the film The Windmere Children contrast sharply with the depictions of the self-portrayal of a group of 15 Polish Jewish child survivors in an exhibition, My Jewish Parents, My Polish Parents, this exhibition uh, was prepared by child Holocaust survivors living still in Poland. And of course, this is a generation in making, a generation that had its voice suppressed throughout the communist period and only in the aftermath of the political transformation of 1989, it started to talk about their wartime as well as post-war experiences. And the exhibition relates some of the raptures and other messy events in the children's lives in a simple, poignant and intimate manner. There are 15 children uh, that uh, are the actors, historical actors in these exhibitions. Each of the child survivors' history is presented in the three intertwined sections. And the children survivors' voices presented in this exhibition actually counteract, disrupt the conventional framework of looking at, uh, at the child, child survivors' lives with an optimistic a bit summary of the survivor's post-war life to show the individual triumph over the sheer distractions. The exhibition speaks about the vulnerability of the children in the worlds of adults and their late post-war attempts at the recovery of the traces of their pre-1945 childhood and identities. And in my view, this is a valuable lesson from the Holocaust that can be used in the public discussions about the current refugee, child refugee crisis. Of course, we have to think about the different historical context, and yet this could be a powerful uh, lesson. To shortly summarize, to remember Jewish child survivors in a meaningful and relevant way today, we have to accept that in the aftermath of the genocide, they have transformed themselves into professional adults proud of their family lives, though not all of them, in spite of the multiple wounds, not because they were actually able to rid of the wartime wounds and start anew from a zero point after 1945 that there were time multiple scars, both physical and psycholo psychological, could not quickly and fully heal after the 1945 
and that these wounds have been carried into their child adulthood in spite of professional and social successes in adulthood. Many legacies, such as specific illnesses, fears of separations, fear of entering a taxi, uh, losing a close family member, are part of the post-war lives. So making such voices, such accounts, more accessible to the public, in my view, will teach us that tra traumatic, difficult histories flow through human beings. Thank you. Jill. My goodness, how am I going to go out? <laughs> 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 oh my goodness. Would you mind passing me the clicker, please? Thank you so much. Appreciate that. And we'll wait till the slides come up. There they are. Okay. So we've had a full morning talking about displacement, family separation, and much of my research usually focuses on foster care, which is a family separation. But in order to gain access to foster care, uh, children in the United States are, the gateway is typically through child maltreatment. So I'm going to move us sort of back to our yesterday conversation to talk about maltreatment and the pandemic and see if we can sort of parse out what is the effect of a pandemic on this phenomenon of child maltreatment. I'm gonna focus only on the United States for today, um, but of course there are, um, the pandemic was a worldwide phenomenon. So I'm just gonna set the context for a minute. I'm not a historian, but I, you are not child maltreatment researchers, so we need to find a tiny little bridge, so I'll spend a minute on that talk a little bit about uh, recent historical trends in maltreatment in the United States, and then what happened with COVID, and um, and end by focusing on our most socioeconomically vulnerable kids. So what is this phenomenon we're talking about? What is child maltreatment in terms of a, a common definition we can all work with today? And so here you have the federal definition, which is that any recent act or failure to act on the part of a parent or caregiver Taker results in death, serious physical or emotional harm, sexual abuse or exploitation to a child age 18 or younger. Um, I should m mention that child maltreatment and child welfare services are state specific in the United States. There are 11 states where it is county specific. So this is the big federal frame, but every state actually has its own definition. And so you'll see some variation. Some counties do have some variability, not in their definition, but in their service array. And then when you think about what, who falls into which category, you can see that about 75% of uh, maltreatment in the United States is neglect. And um, there, uh, I know that there are lots of, um, common understandings and maybe misunderstandings of child maltreatment in the CPS system in the United States. So neglect is not poverty. Neglect is not, oh, I'm unable to, you know, get, get to the grocery store this week. Neglect is typically combined as an accumulation of other family challenges. Neglect typically comes in combination with parental substance, significant substance abuse and or mental health concerns and or domestic violence and or, uh, homelessness or significant housing instability. So neglect is typically a combination of a variety of factors pulled together, and it is um, typically considered very serious. It's, it's the most likely type of maltreatment to result in death for kids. Uh, so what do we know about what causes maltreatment? When do things go so awry in family systems? We know that uh, poverty is an exceedingly high predictor so uh, the families who are involved in the child welfare system in the United States are extremely poor. Over 50% of them have an annual income of less than $10,000 per year. And so economic precarity is a significant predictor. And we know when we look over time at macro, macro economic indicators that as the boat rises, child maltreatment falls. As the boat, as, uh, boats fall, child maltreatment rises. So there is, there is a very strong connection. Um, unemployment, parents who are unemployed are two times more likely to maltreat their kids than parents who are not unemployed. Uh, social isolation is a predictor. Parental stress is a predictor, particularly for physical abuse. Um, parents who care for a lot of kids 
are more likely to maltreat their kids. So these are typically larger families of four or more kids. Uh, domestic violence is, um, is uh, very closely connected to um, maltreatment, um, as is, as I said, substance abuse. Uh, so domestic violence, we have about 30% of our families who are involved in child welfare systems um, uh, have domestic violence as an issue. Substance abuse, it depends on the study, somewhere between 30 and 65% of families have a substance abuse issue uh, and significant uh, carceral involvement. So we have to think about these issues and then think about COVID-19 and say, okay, did COVID-19 maybe change any of those indicators? And that's, we'll get to that in just a minute. So just to give you a sense of how, how the, that's maltreatment, but then what is this child welfare system that is designed to respond? And I think the best way to think about it is either as a fire department or as a, as a hospital emergency room. This is not a prevention services, nice things for nice families to keep families safe, healthy, happy, and thriving. This is a United States residual system designed to serve families who are in extreme crisis. And so it is like a hospital emergency room where uh, the system, there are, there are mandated reporters, all of us perhaps, depending upon the state you live in, might signal, I'm concerned about this child, but then a hotline social worker picks up the call and about 55% of the time screens it out and says, sorry, that's not bad enough. I can't help you. And so there's a screen in process. And then if the family is screened in, then there's a determination. How severe is it? Should we get involved? Should it be a voluntary service or an involuntary service? And is it so severe that the family uh, needs to be separated into foster care, or is it less severe so we can serve this family while they're together? So it really is a triage. Again, this hospital emergency room, it's a triage system to figure out what is at the very, very, very tip of this iceberg in terms of severity and, and need in terms of danger and safety and harm. That's the context for the U.S. system. Who is maltreated in the United States? It's babies, 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 babies. Little, little kids are the front of the train driving this system. So uh, it is mostly babies. It's kids under the age of, um, of three. Uh, about 25 per thousand infants are involved in the child welfare system as compared to about 8.4 kids, uh, eight per thousand in the United States. Um, about 44% of kids are white, about 24% are black, about 20%, 21% are Latinx, about 1.5% are Native American, Alaska, um, uh, uh, Native tribal children. So a moment just about race and ethnicity because uh, there are, these are significant disproportionalities. Not for Hispanic children, um, Latinx children, but for black and Native American children the rates are about two times greater than they are for white children. And there's this, I'll just go down a rabbit hole for a tiny minute. There's a very big debate in the United States among the research community. Do we see these disproportionalities because of disproportionate need in certain communities? Or do we see these disproportionalities because of racial bias on the part of social workers? Um, and uh, racial bias is a phenomenon in the United States. There's absolutely no question about that. Um, the studies that suggest that racial bias is the primary driver of this issue are a study of one in the fine city of Texas with a small sample in Houston. All of the other studies, uh, national and state and local, all significantly point to issues of poverty as our driver, poverty as our driver, poverty as our driver. African-American kids are three times more likely to live in poverty in the United States than white kids. And so when you compare black and white low-income children, we actually find that black kids are less likely to be maltreated, less likely to be reported for maltreatment, and less likely to be substantiated as a victim by the child welfare system and drawn into the system. So the narrative that's pretty common at the moment is that these disproportionalities reflect racial bias and they are unfair. The question that I think is beginning to emerge is actually among low-income kids, either black families are healthier than white families and maltreat their kids less often, or 
We are less responsive to low-income black kids than white kids. Or social workers are racially biased and are less likely to serve black kids than white kids. But all of those conversations, we'll set them over here because the differences between the black and white low-income rate is very, very small. Very, very small. So it is a lively debate. It's a really interesting debate. Um, I think that uh, the folks who, who are better with their Twitter accounts win the common narrative. And so you may all think that it is racial bias when, in fact, the data suggests that it's more complicated than that. Okay. So enough of a rabbit hole. Um, how much has this happened? So here's recent trends looking back over about a decade. And you can see that the line is pretty kind of straight. And so our bottom line is the number of kids who we think are, are actually victimized. And the red line is our referral rate. So again, referrals are all, are all of these mandated reporters across the United States who are calling in, signal, 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 I'm worried, I'm worried, I'm worried. So that's the referral rate. And you can see it's actually kind of going down a little bit, but it's fairly relatively flat. So it went from about a high of about 9 point, oh, goodness, about 9.6. Uh, it goes down to about 9.4, and then most recently down to 8.4. The number of victims is pretty darn even. Um, uh, in 2020, though, we had a pandemic. So the referrals f fell, and the number of victims fell uh, from about 9.4 to about 8.4, about a 10% decline in the number of victims. And so then that makes you think, well, wait, we had a pandemic. Really, did family life get so much better? Well, let's, let's interrogate that. You sound skeptical. I wonder what you're going to say. <laughs> you say. I wonder what you're going to say. Oh, and let me, just make, let me just also add, these are national data. So you saw some communities where declines were quite dramatic. So in the city of New York, for example, if you look at March 1919 and March 2020, there was a 30% difference in maltreatment rates with the 30% lower. If you look then at April 1919, April 2020, we saw a 50% difference in terms of 2020 rates being significantly lower. And then you go to May, and it's again about a 50% difference. So some communities saw steep, steep declines in the number of kids who we think were being harmed. And so part of that, we have to be asking, thinking, well, wait a minute, who makes maltreatment reports? Everybody does, depending upon the state, Pennsylvania, everybody does. But in most, uh, in about 19, 20 states, uh, everybody is a mandated reporter, but in the rest, it's professionals, and those professionals teachers. are largely teachers. Yes. And so we closed our schools, and we see that mm -hmm. large percentage of the decline was from teachers. So we saw a 20% decline from teachers. Medical professionals are about 12% of all reporters, and of course, medical professionals also saw their decline because preventive care in-person visits dramatically declined. So. We know, oh, there's, and there's our picture of our decline. So they're pretty, pretty, pretty decent. So, um, oh, and there's, there's some more. Okay. But anyway, let's go to COVID because COVID really did disrupt everything, 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 everything. So you have to think, didn't it, didn't it disrupt family life? Okay. Well, what <laughs> I think it did, it sure it did disrupt my mine. So let's figure out what really happened and what are our clues to suggest that something may have happened. So we know we have the stay-at-home order that happens. And then we know the social isolation increases. We know that there was significant economic dislocation of families. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, in May 2020, 49.8 million people were unemployed. So um, among the folks who were unemployed, only 15% got any money whatsoever from their employer. So it was an enormous economic dislocation. We know that caregiving burden increased because parents were home taking care of their kids. We know that uh, uh, domestic violence increased. When we look at uh, 911 calls nationally, we see that not, um, domestic violence increased. And a systematic review recently said it increased by about 10% nationwide. We know that substance abuse increased. There are some studies, and all of these studies are listed at the end of all of my slides, which suggest that opioid and meth use in particular 
were uh, saw a significant increase during um, during the pandemic. And opioid use, by the way, is the drug of choice that is currently moving our families into the child welfare system more than more than other drugs. We saw crime rates increase, and this is an interesting one. Minor crimes actually declined nationwide. So minor crimes are things that you do apparently in groups, and people weren't engaged in groups. Major crimes, and I didn't know this, increased because major crimes are committed by individuals. Little things like domestic assault, little things like assault and homicide of, the, of a partner. So there was a significant increase in uh, in, in crime. And then, of course, children at the same time that all of these terrible things are happening in the macro environment, kids are hidden from public surveillance because mm -hmm. nobody can see them. So did maltreatment really increase? So we have a number of studies now for, that look at these data from a bunch of different vantage points, which do suggest that maltreatment probably increased. So three of these used hospital admissions data. One's an online survey of parents where they self-disclose, I am a lot meaner to my kids today than I was a year ago. Uh, we have an interesting study from, um, from Reddit where we can see posts relating to parents harming kids being significant, significant, significantly rising. We have data from pediatric trauma units in Maryland, in uh, California, um, both of which show that um, pediatric head trauma increased significantly during uh, the pandemic. The median age of the victims was 11.5 months. Um, uh, that uh, it was not only head trauma, that was the study in Maryland. The California study saw emotional and psychological abuse in their trauma unit at, the, at their pediatric clinic, non-medical neglect, um, physical and sexual abuse rise. We saw emergency room data from a California study, um, most notable increases for children under the age of four. Females, interestingly, black and Hispanic kids more likely. Um, and then uh, internationally, we have some data on child helplines where children call in to say, I need assistance. And the, those trends increased quite significantly. So we do think it increased. We do think that family life got a lot harder for kids during the pandemic. Um, and so what do we know about whether we could have predicted that? And so we have some data on that. In a historical context, there are a couple of studies. After Hurricane Floyd, there was a study that was done to look at the counties that were affected by Hurricane Floyd and the counties that weren't affected by Hurricane Floyd in the same state and looked at trend lines both before and after and in time series analysis and found that, in fact, with the counties with Hurricane Floyd, child maltreatment rates spiked quite considerably for about six months, and then they saw, began to see them come down again. You also see in um, California, oops, did I go the wrong direction? I went in the wrong direction. In California, we had the Loma Prieta earthquake, and there was a similar study done in California after Loma Prieta that found almost the same thing, that in the surrounding counties that weren't affected by Loma Prieta, no difference, but in the Loma Prieta counties, you saw a significant rise in maltreatment rates. Again, it was about a six-month phenomenon, and then things uh, things even out. Similarly, and uh, this is here, Hurricane Hugo, a very, very similar study. Interestingly, Hurricane Andrew didn't have an effect. I don't understand that, but the, that's, what, that's what we know. Um, what finally we, oops, there's, oh, in the Great Recession, of course, 2008, 2009, we have the Great Recession, the financial crisis, and we saw maltreatment rates rise after the Great Recession as well. We also saw um, a number of hospital-based studies showing physical, physical abuse increase after the Great Recession. So I just want to close by thinking about children of color and the pandemic because uh, they are, were the most likely to experience increased poverty. These children were in families who were the most likely to have families who lost their job. These children were the most likely to experience food insecurity. Their schools were most likely to be closed. Many white schools stayed open. Their, their, these kids were the most likely to experience distance learning than white kids across the United States. And many of them lost a parent to COVID. The rates are much, much higher than the rates for white children. So we can anticipate that given the disproportionate, disproportionate burden of caregiving for many of our low-income African-American 
and Latinx and Native children that the effects of COVID were very likely highly severe for these populations. So I just leave you with a thought, which is pandemics are really hard on kids. Pandemics are hard on families. Pandemics are a crisis. But more importantly, in the United States of America, too many of our children of color are living in a crisis every single day. Too many of our kids of color are experiencing maltreatment, food insecurity, extreme rates of high poverty, schools that are under-resourced. And we have to pay attention to these issues, not because there's a pandemic. We have to figure out a way to deal with these issues every single day. So those are some of my thoughts on that sober note. Finally, for discussion. But, Jill, you raised an issue that I'd like all of you to address, Joanna, too. You said that certain results are predictable, that what we look at when we look at history is we see the same patterns occurring again and again. And therefore, I ask all of you, what should we do? Based on, on what you've seen from your own experience, from your own research, uh, what should be our response if certain kinds of effects of displacement are consistent over time? Jill, do you want to try to go first? I hate to put you on the spot, but... Oh, well, no, I'm happy to answer. Um, I think that our best, um, this does not speak to the migration issue, which there are so many pull, push and pull factors um, that I, I'm going to leave to my colleagues who know that feel better. But in terms of child maltreatment, um, I mentioned that we have studies following the Great Recession, which suggests that maltreatment rose. We have really, really, really good data that suggests that when we give families a child care tax credit, child maltreatment falls. When unemployment, unemployment falls, child maltreatment falls. When families get an EITC, family maltreatment falls. Families that have access to Medicaid and Medicaid-oriented states, child maltreatment falls. The data are just, I mean, they just line up. Give families a chance to have a financial stake in society, give families a chance to be able to take care of their kids and put food on the table and have a roof over the house, house. And families are much less likely to harm their kids. Does it disappear? Of course it doesn't disappear. Some families are struggled, struggling other ways. But if we could ease the financial burden on families through whatever, we could all disagree or agree about how we do that. But if we could manage financial economic precarity in a way that was more um, responsive, we would see kids being taken care of by their kid, parents in much more, in uh, much better. Friederica, how yeah. about you take a shot at this? <laughs> so if we look at displacement, what I said is that I think we should really stick to the rule of not separating children from their parents. Mm -hmm. So no unaccompanied migration, no unaccompanied displacement. Mm -hmm. I think there shouldn't be any more, one shouldn't rely anymore on the practice of sending children for evacuations anywhere else with, against their will at a young age. So if they're 10 or 15, it's, it might be a good development or a push factor for the de development. But I think to send children at a young age away, I think is something which might really cause trauma. Um, and I think something what is often uh, not well done, at least Germany doesn't do that properly. Um, I think whenever children are uh, coming with massive migration waves, I think governments do the best to invest as much money as possible into the education, into language learning, into anything to help them to feel integrated. Because in the long run, then they will not suffer from trauma. They feel better integrated. They will be more useful to the economy and to the state. So I think to the investment aspect, so the financial investment, I think is absolutely essential to enable the adaptation and integration into the recipient country. Adida, Lisa, and then Joanna. Joanna, you're going to get the last word. Um, Adida? So I want to echo what um, Frederica is saying about we should not evacuate children. 
we simply should not. If they need support, they should be supported in their communities. Um, but children who move of their own volition are a reality, as are children whose parents are killed in the process of displacement, right? So what do we do with them, right? Um, in the U.S. in particular, we have two different groups of children we're dealing with. We're dealing with unaccompanied alien children, and we're dealing with unaccompanied refugee minors. Mm. And the, the way to respond to these are different. Our overwhelming majority of children are, are what become legally categorized as unaccompanied alien children, right? They're not brought in through the refugee system. They are children who arrive at the, of their own volition at the border. Um, and the reality is that although many of these children, probably somewhere in the 60% range, have experienced the kinds of human rights violations that would entitle them to asylum, the overwhelming majority of them also are separated from parents who are living undocumented in the US. So their reasons for coming are mixed. They're simultaneously fleeing and seeking re reunion with family members, right? So if we want to address that, we have to address the problem of undocumented immigration to the US, right? Which means we need a better and fairer and more responsive immigration system that ties admission of immigrants to demand for laborers in the country. The workers that come here and work undocumented that our economy needs to survive should be given work permits. It's very simple, mm -hmm. yeah. right? Um, and then they can bring their children with them and their children won't have to migrate by themselves, right? Um, we should also prioritize refugee admissions for the Western Hemisphere. Many of the movements of people from Latin America that can in fact be classified as refugee movements are intimately entwined with U.S. intervention in the Americas, right? Let's own that and prioritize refugee admissions from our hemisphere, right? So that's how I think we begin to deal with the unaccompanied alien children situation. As far as children who come in as unaccompanied refugee minors, and I pointed out that we continue to act surprised <laughs> that there are unaccompanied children in every movement of refugees, right? Like, let's just stop that, right? We have an Office of Refugee Resettlement. We have, since 1980, an institutionalized unaccompanied refugee minors program. What is missing, however, is a specific group that does what they would call in the military future ops. Let's take as an assumption that every time there is an international crisis that produces displacement, there's going to be kids. And let's have them plan out and do future ops so that and, and have a rapid response team so that, for example, when Afghanistan falls to the Taliban and people begin moving from Afghanistan, let's assume there will be some children and have a rapid response team that begins before the children start appearing to do things like preparing for access to halal meals, gathering prayer rugs, gathering translators so that they are ready, right? Uh, let's learn from history, please. <laughs> yes. Ruben <laughs> then Joanna. Yes. Uh, easy questions. <laughs> easy questions. <laughs> I, I would I would uh, like to address a couple of the mains. I think um, there's an urgent need for, to reconceptualize mental health services as a provider. I see that in very important ways. It was shocking to me how mental health services were too purist and like evidence-based treatments would not have an infusion and understanding of oppression, discrimination. And uh, we're just generating that data and, and it's like so daunting to think about that reality. And I see it in our curriculum, in the way we train our students. It's a constant struggle. We have the social justice class, but it's completely divorced mm -hmm. from the mental health intervention. So we have a tremendous gap to address there. We have to learn a lot from international movements like global mental health, in which, for example, the way they have um, um, closed the gap between providers and the, and the beneficiaries of intervention by stop relying on the interventionists so much is members of communities who receive adequate training and supervision are the ones who are providing those services. But um, the, the U.S. Uh, mental health service is so vertical according to institution, not horizontal, that prevents us from thinking about those options. But movements like global mental health, um, when the way we see the work they do in Africa, Southeast Asia, they have very important lessons to teach us. Uh, we need to really look, uh, look into the mental health profession and the biases that we have. We have uh, trainings in social justice, etc. But when I provide supervision, I see the microaggressions. I see the many uh, biases that continue to inform us. It's so ingrained 
these issues of privilege are so ingrained that as mental health prof profession, we need to look into that. Yeah, going to the last presentation, I deeply appreciate your emphasis on, on, on poverty and maltreatment because um, that, that is a huge issue that we have uh, learned in our work is it's unethical for us to promote parenting programs without advocacy because you invite the parents to the parenting group, but if they don't have food, if their house is leaking water, if they are being abused, uh, we are creating more harm by creating a false hope. So equating mental health services with advocacy is essential. And uh, this was heavily inspired by the work in the domestic violence field. One of my best friends, she was the first that demonstrated that uh, pairing a survivor with an advocate that would change the quality of life and immediate living conditions like, okay, do you need housing to be removed from the situation of abuse was more effective than women being in counseling. And that completely revolutionized the domestic violence field and now is a rapid rehousing movement that it has taken. So I think, I think uh, that's a very, very important line for us. And then I will go to the issue of as a society, what is, how are we all addressing this? And I go back to our Chilean friends. They have a model in which, as private society, they have taken ownership of mental health and well-being of children. They have said, we are going to be the drivers. And they are the ones facilitating that sustainability with universities and the government. In good times with government, we really scale up services. Bad times, we go down, but we don't lose the provider. We don't lose the continuity that we have. Um, and we talking with them, the issue is like the challenge that we have in the United States. We, in the United States, we're so divided in the states, right? And the Chileans were, we, place, we came so close to um, annihilation uh, during totalitarian regimes that either we do it together or we won't exist. Mm -hmm. And, oh my gosh, it's like, you cry when you hear that. It's like, are we going to get there in the United States? Okay, no, that's, <laughs> that's for a tequila conversation. But, uh, but it's, a, it's a beautiful example that when you are unified and every actor of society embraces that accountability, that change can take place. So I think we need to look outside the United States in terms of the many models we have to address these dramatic crises of mental health and children's rights. Joanna. I think I, I agree with um, all the comments of my um, predecessors, my, uh, the speakers, but actually the key issue is how to do it. It's not only what can be done, but how do we channel that knowledge uh, uh, to practitioners, to politicians, to social workers, uh, because that that's the key issues. Because we can spend hours at workshops, but uh, discussing these matters and agree that things have to be done. But how do we do it? Uh, how do we make profound change? How do we impact uh, the realities? And in my view, I think we badly need centers for the study of childhood and war and genocide, for example, in a global perspective, um, which not only will produce research for scholars, but for particular professional groups. Uh, such as social workers, educators, in, will, will engage with various groups who are in charge of the best interests of a child today. And uh, to give you one example, when it comes to the issue of separation uh, of children from uh, their parents, uh, the issue of, uh, which has been discussed uh, by Anita and Friederica uh, and, uh, and um, the last speaker at, at my panel. We're looking at the, uh, the experience of Jewish children during the Holocaust. The lesson that we can learn, draw on, but we didn't learn, and we are not even interested in learning when it comes to, to the broader public, is that children who are not, not separated from their parents do not have a 
tra trauma of the Holocaust. They, some of these children that I interviewed in Poland who survived with their parents on the Aryan side, hiding, pretending to be Catholic Poles, they do not even consider themselves child Holocaust survivors. So to, well, to look at such a group and to channel that knowledge to in a simple way to social workers, to practitioners, uh, uh, to politicians uh, globally, I think it is a, a challenge, but it is also a great opportunity. And I think we need a community of scholars and practitioners working together uh, on channeling uh, our research uh, on difficult traumatic history um, to groups who can make a difference in practice. And I mean, that's the way we can make a difference. Thank you. A question from online that I'd also like to put to all of you. And that is, what do child traumas, how do they affect adult lives? That is, the children who suffered, how do you think that plays out over the life course? I think that's a question for Josh and Josh. <laughs> 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 I could comment on that just a little bit. I've done a research on uh, children in out-of-home care uh, and their claims to compensation for their suffering uh, to the Swedish state today. And there you have documents like six, 7,000 claims that, that describe how they were brought up and how their, their situation was ignored by everybody. And now they claim compensation. And there there's some rich material about that because it does have a long-term effect in all the ways that you yeah. described here. So the, it's really the nothing. Only, the only cautionary I would give to that is that and this, I admit that this is, for some people, this is one of the downfalls of my work. I think of it simply as we can't all do everything, right? <laughs> I tend to focus on questions of representation and sort of uh, things like that, right? I think that when we as historians are looking at archival sources in which even children or, you know, adult children are now describing their experiences of trauma and how it affects their later life, that there is some information there about their lived experience, but there's also a whole lot of mediation. And so what we're looking at is how are they representing what they experienced and why? To what political purpose are these representations being put? Um, what sort of, even like when you write a, a memoir, right, to be published, there's a particular convention in how you tell that story where there's trauma and then I must overcome, right? And then there's the victory. Um, in, in cases of requesting reparation, it also has to be framed in a particular way, um, uh, right? Definitely. But my point there was also actually to take one step further and thinking about how does governments react to these kind of things? Like yeah. How does government in hindsight evaluate their own actions in the past? Mm. I think that's an important aspect. Mm. That also tells you what kind of thing. And I mean, it's kind of interesting in, in my context, where of course, Swedish government never does anything wrong. So, so <laughs> yeah. we find it very difficult. Yeah. And the interesting thing is that it brings in an historical perspective of it, because according to the law, that the treatment of the children should be evaluated according to the standards of the time. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. what the darn right. thing do we know about the standards of the time of treating children during the 1930s, 40s? Right. Did they all beat their children all the time? Or Probably. did they not do that? <laughs> I don't think they actually did that. But it is evaluated yeah. under the premises yeah. that before everybody was really maltreated. Mm -hmm. And now, so if you're claiming that you were sexually abused and maltreated at the time, well, you will not get compensation because at that time, that was normal, that was normal. including harassment by young girls and sexual offences and stuff like that. Okay, so okay. it kind of brings this issue, the historical mm -hmm. answer. Okay, I'd like to take a step backwards to what one of the things that Joanna said. Loud. Ah, louder. Okay. I'd like to step, just take a step backwards to, uh, to one of the things that Joanna said. And that is, and this is important for all of us, 
There are documents telling us how children felt. And, uh, we, and we need to return to those documents. Uh, I mean, that it can be interpreted in all kinds of ways. One of the documents, for example, that has not been included here is that Patrizia Guarneri has been putting together an enormous documentary collection of those families, including some individual children, who fled from Italy during the fascist regime because they couldn't, most of them were Jews, but not all of them, because they couldn't survive within the fascist regime. She is literally doing a collection online of all the, as many of those families as she can collect. So as historians and as social workers and as people who are interested in policy, we need to become more aware of all the various kinds of collections that actually exist and return to the, the testimony of children. Yeah, in response to that, I think Joanna's idea to have a center for the study perfect. would be a perfect place perfect. to have one part which is about D8, digital huma humanities, yeah. and digitization of such collections. Correct. For instance, if one looks at child displacement throughout the 20th century, I would like to write an article on that. I have a huge problem because I don't have access to sources mm -hmm. on certain child evacuation schemes. So I think that would be a substantial part uh, from starting yeah. with the source. Versus getting to the political impact of such an institute. Mm -hmm.